Game Time with Boomer Esiason. This week's guest is Pittsburgh Steelers coaching legend, Bill Cower. Presented by GoDaddy and Geico. In describing today's guest, Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger said this, that chin, that scowl, <laughs> that spit coming out of his mouth, that accent, all those things are Pittsburgh through and through. Now, growing up just across the Ohio River from Three River Stadium, he coached his hometown Steelers for 15 years, guiding them the Super Bowl 40 victory. And since his retirement in 2007, he's been sitting right next to me on the <laughs> NFL today. It's a pleasure to welcome the great Bill Coward. Uh, Good to see you, Bill. Boom, it's great to be here with one of your multiple jobs that you do. I, mean, <laughs> I appreciate it. It to amaze me. All right, you grew up in Pittsburgh, man. I did. And uh, you were a high school football player, a phenom, uh, People knew about you, and you end up going to NC State of all places. How did, did that happen? Everywhere I went, went to Penn State, no one would offer me a scholarship. I think when I showed up, they go, wow, he's a lot thinner than I thought he was. And I wasn't that fast. I was a skinny little boy. But Lou Holtz and uh, Larry Bechtel actually recruited me at NC State. And they offered, Larry offered me a, a scholarship. And he's, I was on a plane coming back from Maryland. Mm -hmm. And he says, what were you doing down Maryland? I goes, and he goes, if you're good enough for Maryland, you're good enough for NC State. And he goes, I'm going to offer you a scholarship. I'm going, oh, great. They didn't, but you just did. <laughs> <laughs> then he came up. He goes, I, got, I should watch some film with you. So I watched some film. Lou Holtz came up. They offered me a scholarship. And I went down and uh, played one year with Lou. And then he actually came up here um, and coached the Jets after my right. freshman year. And that's when uh, uh, Bill Ryan took over. Uh, you know, you had a good career at NC State. But, you know, at the end of the day, you ended up becoming a special teams player. I don't know if people know this. You were a special teams player uh, in the NFL. And, you know, you, you famously broke Jeff. Fisher's leg, the yes. form, you know, the coach yes. that uh, yes. later became just like you, a coach. You guys yeah. used to yeah. go after each other. Um, what was it like being a, like a bubble guy in the NFL, and, and how did that help you become a coach? You know, I wasn't going to get by on an athletic ability. I was going to get by based on my preparation and my ability to find some kind of competitive edge where I may maybe anticipate a formation and breaking down things and angles. And so I think when you get to the coaching element of it, those types of players um, understand the game and the idiosyncrasies of the game, and consequently, I think they become better teachers. When did you realize you wanted to be a coach? Even while I was playing as a pro, I just loved the game. And actually, when I got cut my first year in '79, I went back down, got back in school, and I was a GA with Bill Ryan. Okay. And so I was actually coaching linebackers you know, that year. And I go, wow, this is kind of fun, you know, just being able to give other people some wisdom that you had and teaching them some of the things that you understood. And so when, you know, when the opportunity came, you know, when I got, I got hurt in 84 and Marty Schottenheimer took over that right mid yeah. middle of the 84 season, he called me up and just asked me if I would like to get into coaching and just to think about it. And so um, he called back like a week later, what do you think? He goes, I go, well, he goes, what are you going to make next year? I said, like, 130. He, right. he goes, well, I'm going to tell you this. You're going to work three times as much, and you're going to make three times less. I'll give you a job as special teams coach for $50,000. And let me know by tomorrow. I'm going, wow, okay. <laughs> Man, can I just think about this? All one That's it. And I had 24 hours, and I sat there, and I was sitting there, and there was ice in my knee. It was like my third orthoscopic surgery. I was a special teams captain at the time. I looked at the Eagles schedule the next year. We was coming, figured it out. Yeah. About 12 games were going to be on turf. I was just tired of the turf and tired. You know, and every year was going to be, I was going to have to fight for my job. I said, at least now I can start coaching. But I'm going back to coaching guys I played with. Right. So I was 28 years old going back coaching with Hanford Dixon, coaching Frank Minifield, guys I, I was a teammate with like three years earlier because I played there. And so... You know, I, I learned, you know, I went back and I had to kind of separate myself from player to coach. Well, we're going to get into that coaching and the wisdom that you've always imparted on me. Run the ball. Run the ball. <laughs> All right, we're just getting warmed up here on Game Time. We'll continue with Bill Cower right after this. You're watching Game Time with Boomer Esiason. When interviewed by Investors Daily a few years ago, the headline read, Bill Cower gained respect as an NFL coach while giving it. Bill, was that one of the secrets that you had? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I think um, part of coaching is being able to relate to players mm -hmm. um, and I think being able to push the right buttons. And I think I was a blessed to have a lot of great mentors along the way. Truthfully. Just so you know, I opened this whole segment talking about Ben Roethlisberger describing yes. him. 
that picture is you. That is you in a, in a nutshell, yeah. the intensity and everything. And, you know, for me, it's like you started as a special teams coach for right. your mentor, Marty right. Schottenheimer. Right. What was it like coaching special teams? I think coaching special teams, and I've said this before, it's the only, play, only coach outside the head coach who stands in front of a team all 50 players, and you're really motivating more than you're doing schematic things. So you're trying to push the players to understand covering kicks is more of a mindset than it was anything else, returning kicks. And so you're trying to schematically bring offensive and defensive mm -hmm. players together. You became the head coach of your hometown team. Yeah. And I know what the Pittsburgh Steelers mean to you, mean to that city, that community. I mean, it just runs through your blood there. And I see it every week on your face on yeah. the NFL today. Yeah. Yeah. Even though you're not there, you're oh. still there. I don't care what you say. Your it memory's is. there. Your legacy is there. You know, when I got the job, boom, I never, I'll never forget the day, this day when he offered me the job that Sunday afternoon and my wife was with me. And, you know, I, he said, well, you want to be the next coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers? And I said, yes, yes. On the way out, he goes, do you want to know what you're going to make? I go, oh, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I don't even know what the contract is, but I'm going to be there. And I remember going back to Kansas City, and I was laying in bed, and I said, wow, if in three years, if I don't screw this up, I can go back to the, being the head coach in my high school cl class reunion. It was a 20th class reunion. I go, I can go back and be the head coach of my hometown team at our class <laughs> That's reunion. That's all you were caring about? The first yeah, thing I said is don't get fired the first three years. <laughs> and so that was my first my first goal. And actually, yeah. my, that, that, that 20th class reunion was 1995, which was actually the year we had in the, in the summertime. Right. And that year we actually gone to the Super Bowl. 15 yeah. years of the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you're a coach. Did, what made you decide to walk away from it? You know, I, I, I don't know. I was so blessed because my parents were still there. They were to see their grandkids raised. Um, I have never lost sight of I still was where I grew up because, you know, I had my parents there every Thanksgiving. I would go over there if we weren't playing in a game. And you sat in the same seats and did the same thing. And But, you know, I think after a while, it, it was a small town. And, and, my, and my wife at the time, um, you know, the, the, the style of life, the living in the bubble, um, it uh, became a lot. You know, a couple kids had gone off to college and um, are getting ready to go off to college. And so I, um, you know, I, uh, I, I just thought it was just time to step down. You know, I work with you at CBS, so I know the answer to this, but I think the world needs to know. How many job offers have you had since you uh, left the Pittsburgh Steelers? <laughs> um, Tell the truth now. Come no, on. No, 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 no. But, but I, I, I never got down to an offer, but there's been a lot of inquiries, right? Yes. So yearly there's an inquiry like, oh, would you want to do it? Now, the last couple of years, it really hasn't been. And I think people know I'm really, really happy with my lifestyle. I love living in New York. I've become a New Yorker. I love the balance I have my, in my life. Um, I lost my wife in 2010, blessed enough to meet my current wife, who, who is a New Yorker and a Chets fan. Yes. That's a sad <laughs> thing fan. for her yes. um, right now. But, um, <laughs> but you know what? Boom, I'm in a really good place. Um, I love working like with you every Sunday. It kind of gives me a football fix. I mean, I couldn't even imagine not watching football, with foot, without football guys around me. Right. You know, it just seems like it's the right place for me and it's the right <laughs> platform, but it's a great balance I have in life. It certainly is. All right, we'll be back with the 1992 NFL Coach of the Year after these messages. You're watching Game Time with Boomer Esiason. You know, in his 15 years as their head coach, the Steelers made the postseason 10 times. All told, his teams won eight division titles, but they lost four heartbreaking AFC championships at home and Super Bowl 30 to the Cowboys. I'd give it all up for a ring, he used to say, until his squad beat Seattle in Super Bowl 40. And I remember watching you after that game. It's like the weight of the world was off your shoulders because of your background, where you came from, the yeah. team that you took to the Super Bowl, what that what that victory meant to everybody in your life and what it meant to the city of Pittsburgh. It, and it did, but I think, you know, for so long, you know, you get defined by the losses. And for the first time, you know, it didn't almost hit me like, okay, we actually won this. And um, and that whole year, you know, we were seven and two. We lose three games, go to seven and five. We have to get into the sixth seed. No six seeds ever even been to a Super Bowl, let alone won it. And just the whole story and how that thing went. And, and you're right, it is about the people that are with you along the way. And for me, really, it was about the family. It was my wife and my three daughters who, you no, know, they suffered through those losses. You know, you sit there and you talk about all the, how close you could have been. And, you know, and you go to the Super Bowl and your fourth year and, we lose. I said, well, well, we'll get back. We didn't get back to for till 10 more years. And, right. and you, it's hard. It's, yeah. the, the coaching is hard in this business. You take nothing for granted. Just winning the game is something you need to appreciate. You know, people see the Sunday 
They yeah. don't see what goes into oh, the Sunday yeah. and how many sleepless nights right. you as a coach must right. have. And you get those calls in the middle of the night, there's something wrong, and then you got to handle it. And how many things that come across your desk? Yeah, it, it encompasses a lot. And I think the thing for coaches is as you go in there, there's no manuscript or blueprint as how to become a head coach because every building is different, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, how you delegate is so, so very important, but also to have your thumb on everything is very, very important. And, you know, whether you're an offensive coach or defensive coach, if you're the head coach, you should have your thumb on the offense, defense, and special teams. Because when it's all said and done, if the ship's going down, it's not going down in the hands of somebody else. And I, I, I took that as that was my approach to coaching. And at the same time, I wanted people to be comfortable, to delegate, to be innovative, to be creative. But it was going to have to go through me in the very end. In Super Bowl 40, uh, Randall L. to Heinz Ward, who calls that play? We have been practicing this play for three or four weeks and we've always had some gimmick plays we always had in and we always thought about playing them and i just remember i told ken was i said a hoosier special which was at hoosier was was l throwing the pass Randall so, l, yeah. right, so the hoosier special i said i said whiz we're not playing next week <laughs> i said we've been practicing this game for this, this this play for like three weeks now i said if there's ever a time it was always right across the 50 it was, right. was that was kind of we always knew where it was it's got across the 50 to mm -hmm. take a shot and then, boom, he called it. I go, great call. That's great because it, it actually brings me back to Doug Peterson and Frank Wright calling Philly special right. against the Patriots. You right. just never know when you're going to use it. You do you have the guts to call it, though. Right, right. And I think that's the, you know, listen, we did the onside kick in, in Super Bowl 30, which mm -hmm. is, a, you know, I think you get into those games sometimes being unconventional and thinking a little bit outside the box because everyone has all this data on you and we break down things and we take, you know, analytics to, to the umph degree. And sometimes you have to go against the grain. Sometimes you got to do things that are unconventional, particularly in big games, and not be afraid to do that. And I think that's the key to having success. Well, that was that was a huge play. Yeah. Um, it, it was a momentum changer. There's no question about that. Do you think winning that Super Bowl allowed you to walk away from the game as early as you did? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think, you know, having gotten so close for so long, I, and I look at Andy Reid and, I just think about Andy, and I feel about the same thing for myself. Man, we were in the playoffs every year, and that was a given. It's like, okay, then all of a sudden you get there, and you get there, and the closer you're getting, you just start thinking about, all right, how far can you going to go? And so it, it validates a lot of things. It truly does to be there for that long and to have that kind of success and to be able to win a championship. But I just, I know one thing. I, I wouldn't take away anything from those games that we lost. Um, you know, I don't think I would change anything. They were all close games, and. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You know, you went on a uh, on a trip, and you went with uh, Coach Coughlin, I believe, was on this trip. Yes, yes. And it was an overseas trip for our troops and everything else like that. And you got to share a bunk with Coach Coughlin, right? Vice President Biden was actually out there, so he got this whole end of the suite. It was, and so we had to all go into one room. All it's right. John Harbaugh, Jeff Fisher, Gruden, myself. And Coach, and Coach, Coach Coughlin. Coughlin. Well, there's one bed in the in the middle. Right. And everyone else has got bunks. So. Hey, hey, Coach Coughlin was the mentor. He got he got the one in the middle. But the problem was, is that he snored. Okay, <laughs> so we're all sitting there, and after the first night, we were there for like we were there for like five days. Right. All of a sudden, wow, man, he's really bad. So I I tried to sneak back a couple times to fall asleep before he got into his bed, and he got into his bed, and Tom Coughlin's like. He, he just took the one sheet over. Right. He would lay there like this, <laughs> pull the sheet back. Not, I don't think he moved. No, and, within, and within five seconds, it was... <laughs> <laughs> that, that is awesome. I love that story. All right, game time will continue after these messages. I love that. I love that story about Coach Coughlin. <laughs>
to, to Cleveland with me as a player, um, then to, as we went on to, to coaching, and to having three daughters. Um, she was a tremendous partner. Um, she allowed me to do what I did on the field, and at the same time, when I came back in, she brought stability in my life. And I was, I was an assistant coach when I walked back in the house. I was no longer the head coach. I right. was an assistant coach. She kept me in place. I leaned on her a lot. Um, she gave me the great perspective, I think, that every coach needs. So she was truly my backbone through the course of my time coaching. And, and, and watching her go through what she went through, from knowing you for all these years, just how difficult that must have been for you and your daughters. It, it was, boom. I mean, you know, you, you, you see someone and, and you, you, I stepped down for her, and I, to this day have no regrets and so glad I did because I, I was able to special, spend a lot of special time just with us. And our daughters did as well. And, you know, we talk about her a lot, um, you know, and it's, it's all great memories that we have. And at the same time, I was blessed to have met my current wife. And, and, they, and my daughters love her to death. And so she's, and she always asks about my late wife, you know, right. what was she like? And I, and I said, you guys are very similar. You're very powerful women who are very strong in their own skin, um, very creative in what they want to do and know what they want to do. And they're, and they're they were good friends. They, she was my best friend, and my current wife is my best friend. You know, the interesting, watching your current wife, Queen V, um, she's a very talented singer, yes, performer. She is. Yes, she is. Uh, she's a rocker, yeah. if you will. <laughs> she is. And uh, you actually participated in a uh, video, oh, a rock video. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I don't know think, what you were thinking. I know, either. but she even asked me to do it. I said, man, you're doing a video and I'm not in it? I said, so you I just, complained about not oh, being I, in I it? I did, and at the last minute, I'm going, I'll just go in and do it. And the last minute, they go, just put some eyeshadow on. So just put some of this, because you have to be back in this thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that thing went viral for a while. I said, man, okay. You know, Bill, you and I have something in common. Yes. Uh, you have uh, three daughters, two yes. of which married professional athletes. Correct. Which I would have advised against. Yeah. Uh, but then my daughter uh, married a professional athlete, too. You and I are kind of, we have son-in-laws who played in the NHL. NHL. And I'll tell you what, if you think about all the sports, NHL players are probably the nicest and most gentlemen of players and people. And I mean that sincerely, not to be bashing any other sport, but right. you know, they're, they, they, the way they do, the way they dress and gum the games yes. and everything else, and the way they treat other people. And, and the, the ironic thing is my, my son-in-law was an enforcer back in the enforcer days, and I think Matt's a pretty big kind of enforcer too. Yes, so, he is. So I don't think you have to worry about that. I think that they know where right. to turn that off. <laughs> yeah, I so, think so too. So. I hope so. <laughs> Kevin Westgarth is your son-in-law. Yeah. Matt Martin is mine, and he's still playing for the Islanders. Yeah. That's the only thing that's wrong with him. He should be playing for the Rangers. <laughs> um, hey, how do you think the NFL is today as compared to when you play? Is it a better league? Is it a safer league? Uh, you know, Have we reached the saturation point? I think it's a great league, honestly. I think sometimes we try to do too much. I think, you know, but I think Roger Goodell doesn't give himself enough credit. I mean, he's gone against the grain in trying to make the game safer. Um, he's instituted roles. Um, the equipment's better. The protocols are better. We're teaching the game better, and that's the most important thing, and even at the grassroots level. And I just think that message needs to get out there to the moms. And that's who, it's, that's who we have to kind of find some way to resonate with and let them know that the game of football really does – provide a unique ability for a young person just to be able to understand competitive um, competitiveness, lead, um, uh, uh, teamwork, yep. you know, putting a helmet on and be a part of something. Responsibility. And, yeah, and, 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 you know, time management. And, you know, and it also gives kids a sense of confidence, self-confidence. You know, most of the other sports, you can't take a large, slow kid and put him in a sport outside of maybe football, right. where he now feels like he's a part of something. And, you know, my son wanted to play, and he has cystic fibrosis, and he played. Right. And he was a part of a team, and that's what meant more to him than right. anything else. And right. it did give him self-esteem, and it gave him awareness, right. and it gave him a part of being something bigger than him. Exactly. Which is which is really important. The other, the other thing I, I did want to finally ask you is, uh, I know you had a very cozy relationship with a lot of the officials that were officiating your game, <laughs> and I've noticed that over the years. You never yelled at anybody. No, we're, uh, you know, it was respectful. It was well. It okay. was well, except for the one time when I actually took the uh, the, the video. You took the video. I took picture. a picture. I took a picture and I put it into his um, top pocket. I yeah. did. I that was did. very nice. I, that you know, was that not. Was that, was that was not one of my. As a matter of fact, and I, truth be told, my daughter came up and said, "Daddy, I'm so glad you did that to that official." And I said, "No, Lauren, your father was wrong. I should not have done that. You don't show people up when things happen like that. I should have handled it better." So I. I 
I've caught myself at times, but when we've talked in the sideline, I would just always express myself, Bill. Okay. I just want to make sure we're on the same page <laughs> okay. and we had, we had open lines of communication. Just you and Bill Belichick, very similar. <laughs> uh, do you think the officiating can be improved in the NFL? I think, uh, yeah, you, you can always get improved. I think sometimes we got to do less to, to get better at it because I think that we can start talking the same language. And I think the biggest thing for coaches is they want consistency. Do you talk to Mike Tomlin often? Um, periodically. Yeah, tell them to stop throwing the red flag. <laughs> all right, our thanks to uh, Bill Cower for joining us today and to all of you for watching on Boomer Science. And I'll see you again soon right here on Game Time with gymnast Caitlin Ohashi. Good job, Coach. <laughs> the thing about Pittsburgh, I just I will say, is like you can take the people out of Pittsburgh, but you'll never take the Pittsburgh out of people. Just growing up four miles from that stadium, and it's a very special time with, with people that got great pride and passion.